All right, so uh, chapter three today, we are going to be looking at, um, you know, this is chapter three. Uh, again, I will be sending this out to you guys today. So if you need it uh, in your BCA manual, I'm sorry, BCS manual, uh, you can see it right here. So please, everybody read through this today. It's uh, it's not that many, it's, yeah, it's like 20 pages, but they move really quickly because most of the pages are pictures. <laughs> um, so uh, looking at this, right, um, you know, the two most widely known approaches to understanding our clients, like if we need to understand someone's, you know, about someone's posture, we make them move a certain way and then their body kind of gives in certain ways. And so it's like, oh, okay, well, your knee buckled like this. So that means that your adductors are overactive, you know, um, or, you know, you have this, uh, you know, excessive lean that shows me that your, your calves are really tight. So, the two ways that we get uh, kind of a similar approach here, but from understanding about how our clients think or whether or not they're ready for change, are understanding the ideas of like screenings versus like assessments, right? And so the two widely used approaches that we're going to focus on is, is what we call multimodal screening. Uh, multimodal screening is basically this way that we're going to gain uh, a very clear picture of how our clients think and how our clients behave. Uh, and then we are going to use that to understand where they are in the stages of change model, right? Remember that trans theoretical model of change that we talked about, you know, understanding whether or not someone's in pre-contemplation or contemplation, uh, if they're in the preparation, action, or maintenance phase um, of changing, right? So screenings and assessments, this is just something I put up here is kind of a good uh, kickoff point. So screenings and assessments are a large part of the coaching process because they help us determine a very clear picture of how an individual thinks and behaves, and that allows us to determine which interventions and strategies are going to be the most effective. So, you know, uh, like if you were to do a, a screening or an assessment on me and uh, you wanted to figure out like whether or not um, I tend to use like maybe really negative uh, descriptions of like my lifestyle or maybe you wanted to determine like whether or not I'm like ready to really fully engage in like an exercise program, right? You would like ask a series of questions about like what, how I generally think, how I generally behave, how I generally feel, um, you know, what sensations uh, I feel and things like that. A um, little bit about like maybe even just like the drugs and biology, like running through like my lifestyle, like, hey, are you on any medications or like, you know, do you take any recreational drugs? You would want to know about those things because like that might inform you uh, what type of like workout routine, like what's most important for me? You know, like I love to ask people a bunch of questions, uh, at the front of like a session that are just based around like the idea of, of what is their, what is their, um, workout journey looked like so far. So I love to like ask a lot of questions like, well, have you ever worked out before? Have you ever engaged in like a regular exercise program? Uh, and they'll say, oh yeah, I mean, I've worked out like here and there and I'm like, okay, well, what does that actually look like? Like, you know, are you very consistent with it? Like it is a scheduled out thing or do you just find that like you go whenever you feel like it? Like what is, what is your workout world kind of look like? And uh, if I find that like, they're like, well, you know, I've, I've been kind of inconsistent about it, which is a pretty common thing. Like that's, that's generally what most people are going to say. Um, I will immediately start making a couple of assumptions and a couple of like, you know, strategies in my head where I'm like, okay, well, this person has struggled being consistent. We need to find a way to make it just part of their routine, you know? Um, and so like, that's, that's something that we can kind of screen for in this initial assessment. So that's really what we're going to be looking at today, right? So multimodal screening uh, aims to develop a very clear picture about how our client thinks and behaves. So this is going to be when we talk about multimodal screening, it's going to be uh, a lot of very detailed questions about very specific things because we're trying to understand how our client, like I said, thinks and behaves. And there's going to be an acronym that we see here in just a little bit. Um, but that allows us to make like very informed decisions about like what strategies are going to be most effective for this client, right? Um and so that's why we have our screenings and then understanding that stages of change model, right? We are trying to basically assess for how ready our client is to behave. So we know which strategies are going to be most effective. So the big thing to remember, guys, and this is a very key thing to remember, not everybody is ready for change. Like not every client that you have is just going to be ready to like drop everything that they're doing in life and just start exercising, you know, five, six hours a week. 
that's a pretty big commitment for a lot of people. And so they're not really ready to commit to something like that or like changing their diet. Like that's, that's something that not a lot of people are really like ready or, you know, committed for. Right. So we need to be able to understand like which interventions are going to be most effective based on where our clients are in that stages of change model. You know, I had a student who uh, he wanted it. He was like, a, he was brand new. I think this was like his first mod. Uh, and we were, we were in this course and he was, you know, he was like, um, I really want to get my exercise, my, my, my girlfriend exercising regularly. Like she exercises a little bit now, but like, you know, she, she, she needs to be more consistent about it because like he had kind of gone through his own, like, uh, you know, uh, fitness journey and stuff. And he'd, he'd seen like a lot of success and he was feeling really good and he was really happy. And so he wanted to share that with his girlfriend, you know, which I was like, great, man, that's, that's, a, that's awesome. Um, but he was like, he was like, I just need to, he's like, can you help me like write a, a program for her? And I was like, well, why don't you tell me a little bit about like, why doesn't she exercise regularly now? You said, and he, you know, he said that uh, you guys both have the same gym membership and like you encourage her to come with you pretty frequently, but she doesn't go. Right. And he's like, yeah, he's like, that's the thing. She needs like a really good program to stick to. And I was like, I don't think that's what she needs. <laughs> um, it sounds to me like she's just not really ready um, to commit to like a full like program. So you could write like a really great program that might be super effective for her. But if she's not going to do it, it's not really the most effective program. And it was like, uh, and so what you need to do instead is focus more on like, you know, educating her on how easy it would be to stick to like a regular program, uh, get her comfortable in the gym, you need to expose her to it. Cause it sounds like she's any, you know, he said a lot of other stuff as well. Um, but it's, she was very uncomfortable, basically. She was like new to the gym experience. She didn't really know what to do. Um, and because like he was doing his own workouts and they were doing a very different thing, he wasn't really guiding her through that. And I was like, honestly, what you should do is schedule your workout maybe an hour before hers, get your own lifting in and then, you know, grab yourself a protein shake and drink and like work with her and like show her around and get her like super comfortable with everything in the gym. And so he started doing that instead. And then she got, she knew how to do everything on her own. And then they started going together. And then it was like, all right, well, now that she knows how to, now that everything is like kind of put together, she knows how to work the machine. She knows how to like, you know, find everything that she needs in the gym, knows how to do a basic hinge, a basic squat, a basic pressing motion. Yeah, let's write a program. And eventually like, that's where we got to. But like, she was not ready to commit to like a full change. So if you do that with your clients, right? If you assume that every one of your clients is like ready to start like a brand new program today, um, you're gonna be frustrated because not everybody is really in that stage. You know, a lot of times we need to educate people on the benefits of something before they'll even think about committing to do it. Um, and that's what we're gonna see if somebody's in the pre-contemplation stage. So how the heck do we figure it out, right? I mean, that's the thing. Like we know that like it's really freaking important to understand where someone is in the stages of change. How do we figure out where they are? Well, this is where like the ideas of assessments and screenings come in. And there is a slight difference between the two here. Um, so an assessment is a process by which a wellness professional understands their clients in order to formulate a diagnosis. Now, everybody on the call right now, what do you see? Uh, what is your immediate impression about assessments here? What do you guys think about that already? Assessments. Tell you what, let's look at the idea of a screening here. So an assessment, we get understand how our clients, we gather adequate data so that we can formulate a diagnosis. A screening is a process by which we understand our clients' issues that affect their health-related interventions. That's a basically a big fancy way of saying it allows us to understand about how our client thinks and behaves so we know what strategies to implement when helping them. But what do we see that's the big difference here? What do you think a big red flag that we're looking for is, guys? Big red flag. For those of you who have been through our nutrition mod, this you know this should feel sound familiar. The answer to what I'm looking for here. What do you guys think? Is it their diet? Not quite. Not Was quite. That? I like your heads at. So you know uh, why would why would I say that there's something wrong with us doing an assessment?
Remember your scope of practice. So what did we talk about? Like, let's go back to nutrition here. What did we talk about in nutrition, guys? What are trainers not allowed to do? They're not allowed to talk about uh, the nutrition. Just you could, like, give them recommendations, but you can't. You can't diagnose somebody. There it is. You nailed it, guys. Um, so, yeah, Kenny, we are totally allowed to talk about nutrition. We are totally allowed to say this is something that would work really well for you, right? Like we can absolutely lay it out. We can clear a path for our clients. We cannot tell them what to eat. We also cannot, and Charlie, I think, I think it was you. I, I, can't, I didn't see the, I didn't see who lit up. Uh, but we also do not diagnose stuff, at least in this realm right? Like we are not diagnosing our clients in the realm of behavior change. We also don't diagnose our clients in the realm of nutrition. Now, do we do fitness assessments? Yeah, absolutely. Because like if I say, hey, you got tight calves, right? That's totally well within the circle of like personal training, right? So this is another scope of practice conversation, uh, which I know, you know, we repeat a lot. Um, but it is, you know, it's an important part of us understanding like what our role is in this industry, right? In, in all industries, right? So we are allowed to work within this behavior change field, um, but it's all from this idea of guided self-help, right? And we do want to understand about how our client thinks and behaves because then we can make suggestions that will guide our clients to that self-help. And I want to know which suggestions are going to be most effective. So that's why I want to do a screening rather than an assessment. And an assessment is a very highly super detailed version in order that is used for me to like, you know, get an idea of like what someone, you know, like diagnose like, oh, your brain's struggling in this way. You know, like that's not our realm, right? Just like what if someone went to a therapist and that therapist said, you know, this person has like mild depression and their ther or anxiety, right? And the, dep the therapist says, hey, like you should en engage in a regular exercise program. If you start exercising, your brain's going to make endorphins. It's going to make a lot of positive stress hormones and you're going to feel really, really good, right? They're going to suggest that they start exercising, right? That totally within the scope of that, you know, therapist's scope of practice. They are absolutely allowed to say, you know, exercising would be really good for you. But if they were like, hey, you should do three sets of 20 push-ups, you should do four sets of, you know, a hundred lunges, which by the way, that'd be terrible, right? Like they, they, they prescribe like a really bad workout program that they maybe found on the internet. And they're like, you should do this exact program, right? That is totally outside of the scope of practice for that therapist, right? So in the same way that we are not allowed to die, they, they are not allowed to diagnose like, oh, hey, you got rounded shoulders. You should be doing this type of shit. What? No, you're, you're a brain therapist, right? <laughs> like, no, 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 <laughs> right? Uh, we should not be diagnosing any mental um, issues that we sort of think, you know, if your client says something like, hey, like, I've just been really, you know, I feel really bad lately and I have been, you know, really down. I, I feel like I should just stay in bed all day. And like, I just don't have enough energy to get out of bed. Uh, and I feel really numb to the world. You know, all of those like sentences are sentences that are like pretty, pretty common indicators of like depression. Um, however, it doesn't matter if we heard all of that, you know, we are not going to say, hey, you might have like depression, right? Like we don't, we, that's outside of our scope. Instead, it might be something like, well, have you thought about like talking to a therapist about this? Because like a therapist might, you know, be able to, to really help you, um, you know, in the same way that like people come to see me when their body aches a little bit, right? Um, it sounds like your, your, your mental health is struggling a little bit. So maybe seek a professional, right? So that's, that's one of the key differences between these two here, right? So assessments are all about like formulating a diagnosis, which is a big no-no for us, right? So assessments are a comprehensive approach that most fitness professionals will want to avoid due to being related to determining a diagnosis. Um, we aren't therapists, therefore we do not diagnose 
in relation to mental health, right? This is what's so confusing about this. This is why I'm spending like a little bit of time here. Uh, I will say this is very confusing uh, and kind of a pain in the rear because like clearly as our role indicates, like our job, we do do a lot of assessments, but we do fitness assessments, right? Like we are assessing for what someone's recovery pulse is after a little bit of cardio um, in order to determine like how their heart is performing. That's the type of assessments we do. In the realm of behavior change, we want to avoid that kind of approach. Same thing with like uh, in the realm of like, you know, diet as well. Um, I'm trying to think of like other things that we are slightly adjacent to as like personal trainers, you know, uh, like sleeping, you know, like we're not exactly like a, we're not a doctor or a sleep coach either. But if you, if your client said something about like, I'm just having a lot of trouble sleeping, they'd be totally irresponsible for us to say, you should take melatonin. Don't do that. Do not prescribe a freaking supplement to your client. However, if you were to say something like, or if your client asks you about melatonin, you could say something like, well, melatonin is a hormone that your brain produces naturally when you sleep. Um, and it is sold as like a supplement and some people will take it very regularly and it can help regulate uh, your circadian rhythm. Um, but, you know, so there, like we educated, right? We taught about it, but we didn't say like, you should take this. Or if we said something like melatonin might be a potential solution to your problem. If you're, if you, they had never, if they didn't come to you, they didn't know about it, right? You could say, so I'm like, well, melatonin might be a solution to your problem. And then we'd launch in and say, it's a hormone that your brain makes me. So da, 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 right. Like that's a, that's the big difference here, right? We can educate. We're, we're educators. That's, that's our role. Anytime we're outside of our scope of practice. Now, if your client comes to you and says like how many or what, you know, upper back exercise should I do? That is something that's like, I want you to do da, 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 right. That's where we can diagnose away, right? Prescribe away. We prescribe exercise till the cows come home, you know? Um, but in the realm of behavior change, in the realm of diet, things like that, uh, it's outside of our scope. So this is where we have screenings instead. And screenings is a process by which we gather. We understand our clients' uh, issues that are, affect, uh, that are affecting their health-related interventions. So this allows us to gather adequate data, similar to an assessment, about how our client thinks without running into the red flag problem of like doing an assessment, right? It, it remains within our scope of practice because it doesn't gather information. I mean, or, I'm sorry, it does gather information about how our client thinks, but it doesn't do it from the perspective of like trying to formulate a diagnosis. So how the heck, uh, how the heck do we make sure that we are, are doing that? Or, or like what type of data are we, are we gathering? Well, that is going to lead to me showing the first of a NASM video here. So I know I show a lot of crash course videos uh, on in these classes, um, which hopefully have you guys enjoyed. I always think they're kind of fun. Uh, this is a this is actually a NASM video that comes with the behavior change course. Um, I will be honest, this is a little dry. <laughs> uh, the presenter is just not quite as engaging, uh, but it's also a little shorter. So. Um, here is, uh, what is called the basic id or B, uh, you know, um, which is an acronym talking about all the different things that sort of are going on in someone's brain. So this is a, basically what we are going to assess for. Arnold Lazarus emphasized the fact that we are biological creatures that act feel, imagine, and think with his basic id multimodal framework, a way to better organize and understand the influencers of human behavior. These different aspects of our personality and behavior have been given names that are reflected in the acronym basic id. They are behavior, how we act and react, affect, how we have and express feelings, sensation, how we physically feel, imagery, the images or mental pictures we have, cognition, our thoughts or internal dialogue, interpersonal, the interactions we have with others, and drugs biological, any biological influencers such as disease, medications, or injuries. While the original intention of this process was to provide comprehensive assessments for clinicians to counsel clients, it can be modified as a screening process that will help fitness and wellness professionals 
to provide specific intervention strategies for unique client needs. Always be sure to use this screening process in a fashion that is within your professional scope of practice. Let's talk about some basic id specific questions that you can ask when screening clients. For behavior, what does a day in the life of your client look like from getting up in the morning to going to bed at night? Which behaviors could the client increase or decrease to lead to a healthier and better life? For affect, which emotions does the client experience and express most often? Are there concerns with anger, frustration, worry, or confusion? What seems to trigger this person's negative emotions? For sensation, does the client report specific sensory issues like their knees hurting while running? Does this person experience and describe positive sensations like experiencing a high after a hard workout? For imagery, does the client hold negative or positive images about the experience of exercise and healthy eating? How does the client imagine themselves at success? For cognition, what are the client's primary attitudes, values, beliefs, and opinions of particular importance to success and fitness? Does this person have irrational thoughts about goals and expectations? For interpersonal, who are the significant others in this individual's world? Who are the people at work, friends, and family members who play the biggest role in the client's life and behaviors? For drugs and biological, what is this person's current health status? Which medications does the client take? Which issues does the individual have with diet, weight, sleep, exercise, and the use of recreational drugs? By answering these and other similar questions, you'll be able to plan strategies and coaching that are unique and individualized to each person you encounter. Ugh. Stop. Okay. <laughs> It's so freaking loud. All right. Uh, <laughs> okay. So that is um, that's that's sort of an intro to what we're going to kind of be going over here. So looking at um, looking at this idea of like multimodal screening from the uh, we we want to understand these things. Right? We want to understand these categories. The basic id, which will hopefully help you remember. Like we want to understand about our clients' behaviors, effects, sensation, imagery, cognition, interpersonal relationships, and then like drugs and biology and stuff. So um, the multimodal screening process, right? We're looking at this, you know, all these different things. Um, the idea here is that, again, this helps determine which interventions that can be used to initiate desired changes. So basically, this is going to help us determine like what strategies uh, are most effective for us to like implement, you know? Um, like here's the, I know I'll get, I want to give you guys a little bit of insight into my, my brain here. Um, uh, so I am, this is actually not something that's covered in this course, but if you ever want to talk about it, I love talking about this actually. Um, so I am particularly, uh, let's, how do I phrase this? I am particularly sensitive to, uh, a, a, a psychological effect that, that all of us experience uh, called decision fatigue. Um, I'm really bad at dealing with decision fatigue. And what, and, and like I said, this unfortunately isn't in this course, but like um, decision fatigue is basically where if you have to make like a lot of decisions, uh, your brain tends to get a little worn out on that. And so then it is more likely to make impulsive decisions afterwards. So uh, you will hear us talk about this a lot. We, 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 in, our, in our weight loss class, one of the tips that we always tell our clients when it comes to like shopping is to bring a shopping list, right? Um, bring a list. That way you don't have to think about like what it is you're going to be shopping for. You will already be able to stick on to that list because we know that if people spend about 30 minutes or more in any type of store, you are more likely to impulsively buy something because your brain gets to this point where it's like, I don't know. It's like, should we buy this or should we buy this? And your brain goes, uh, this. And it's like, should we buy this or should we buy this? And your brain goes, uh, that. And, your brain goes, and after a while, your brain's like, I don't know, man, get something. <laughs> your brain just gets worn out. Um, I'm sure everybody in here has probably experienced this at some point. If you've ever been like, around like shopping or something and you're just like i don't know and you just end up buying like the the first thing you can get right um i know this about myself i really struggle with decision fatigue 
Um, and after a while, I will get super like exhausted on it, which is actually why um, I've done a couple things in like my lifestyle, which are a little boring, but like they allow me to basically keep my brain space available. <laughs> uh, for, so for instance, like uh, when it comes to like t-shirts, I think I've got like two graphic tees. Now I've got three graphic tees. And then I've got like six white V-necks and six black V-necks. And then like one white, one black, and one gray like crew neck t-shirt. And that's the entire list of t-shirts that I have. And I know them because like they are the only t-shirts I own. And I've got like three button up shirts that go over them. And I can create like a couple varieties there. Um, I've got two jackets. I've got two pairs of shoes that are like my daily shoes. Um, one pair of white sneakers and one pair of like dress, you know, nice dress shoes to go with a suit. And that is all the shoes that I own. And like all of that kind of helps me not have to like, st oh, and I have one pair of jeans. Um, and then I have like a thousand pairs of like athletic shorts because I just grab those out of a drawer and I don't fold them. <laughs> um, that's, 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 I have, a, I have a million pairs of shorts. Uh, <laughs> so, if I had to like sit there and be like, which one of these is my favorite? What, you know, what conditions am I going to like be facing today in, in like the world? I tend to get kind of cranky. <laughs> like I just, I, I do, like I get a little like worn out. I get a little bit of like sensory overload and kind of irritated. Um, and it'll just kind of like, it's a bad way to start my day. So I eliminate all that by just buying basically all of the same thing when it comes to clothing, you know? Um, and that's something that I do to basically not have to think about everything else. Same thing with like hats, right? I just throw a hat on because it's way easier than having to worry about like how my hair looks, you know? Um, and that's simple and easy and effective uh, to help me avoid like decision fatigue. So these are, yeah, what's up, Andres? This is why you need to meditate. <laughs> you are not wrong. Meditation is incredible, incredibly, incredibly good for you. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Meditation is amazing. We're going to talk about meditation in this course. Um, yeah. Uh, and that's thing. It gives me, you know, I get tend to get some anxieties about like having to consider all this other stuff. So, you know, when we look at like how, like my, what my behaviors are, you can tell. Sorry, that, Brad. I'm, I'm only saying that because uh, I'm the same way I feel. Oh yeah. No, please. Oh, no, no. I don't take that as like, don't be sorry. Like that is, I think that, uh, I think that this is an objective fact about my personality. I don't think this is a good or a bad thing. Um, yeah, because you touched on something pretty, you know, pretty important with the whole decision of fatigue. Because uh, I get that same problem here and there too. Uh, right. I need to clear my mind because my yeah. mind could go whew, overboard. Right. Absolutely. Or what about like, what if you had to make the decision to go to the gym every day? What if you had yeah. to like think about what it is every single day you go to the gym? That, I, I, that seems exhausting to me, you know? Right, so. Um, so instead, why don't we just say, you know, I always say this phrase, this is like my catchphrase, birds fly, fish swim, grass is green, sky, sky is blue, and I go to the gym every day. Yeah. It's not a decision that I make, it's just something that happens daily. Right? It's kind of simple and like practical. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I am definitely like a creature of habit. If you look at like my behaviors, you can tell that like, I like a good routine. I like my routine to be very optimized so that I don't have to think about it. Um, and if I do have to think about it, like generally I'm a pretty, I'm a fairly emotionally like stable person, but when I get super overwhelmed by making way too many decisions, emotionally, I tend to get very anxious and irritable. And that's, that tends to be my default negative emotion is irritable. Um, where I get really short with people. Um, and I just, I tend to be very like matter of fact, and um, I tend to be like, I'm not the cheery chipper personality that I, I like to have, a, you know, that aspect of myself. Um, sensations wise, physically, I don't have like regular aches and pains. So, you know, um, physically, I, I guess I have a, a regular pain tolerance, you know, not high, not low. <laughs> Imagery, um, Here's another one when it comes to decision fatigue. Uh, imagery wise, I tend to conjure up pretty basic imagery, but I will often use it to give myself anxiety in really negative ways. Um, so one of my other least favorite types of chores that I, I hate to make, I, uh, I was just talking about this about my room. I was just talking about this uh, to my roommate yesterday. Um, I really have a, a lot of anxiety around like certain types of chores, usually the ones that involve me having to travel somewhere. 
Um, so I really hate getting a haircut. It's my least favorite chore. Uh, Cause you have to make an appointment. You gotta like show up to go get it done. It takes time. And like, I don't know, it's just the one thing that like, I really, it's my least favorite time. You know, some people complain about having to file their taxes. I'll do my taxes. I do them on the computer like that. Going to get a haircut seems exhausting to me. I don't know why. It's, it's just, it's something that bugs the crap out of me. Um, so I conjure up a lot of imagery that seems overwhelming. And then because it seems so overwhelming, I'm like, oh, well, just put it off to tomorrow. Put it off to tomorrow. And then all of a sudden I travel through time and it's six months later. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> right? Um, this may be, you know, I did this for a long time. Oh man, here's a great example from my personal life. I did this for a long time with my freaking credit. Um, when my car got stolen, uh, my credit information got stolen. And so my identity got stolen really, really bad and uh, wrecked my credit. Um, just ruined. <laughs> and uh, I was like, you know, and I, I'd watched all these videos about like, never let your credit get stolen. And it'll, it'll, you know, never let your identity because it'll ruin your credit forever. And it takes years to fix. And people say that on the internet, you hear it all the time. You hear these articles about how their life was ruined with, with this freaking credit and stuff. And then finally one day, and so I was just, it always seems so overwhelming. The imagery scared me into taking any action. I was like, well, it's ruined. And it, I'm just going to leave it that way because the amount of effort that it's going to take to fix it is just not effort that I'm willing to put in. And then I looked into it and it's not that freaking hard. <laughs> it's not actually that bad to repair. Um, and I've been able to do it, you know, but like it took the right type of education to kind of break down those walls and, and help me understand like, you know, uh, imagery wise, uh, it's not so scary, right? Uh, cognition, what someone's internal thoughts and uh, dialogues are. Uh, I like to think that I tend to be a pretty optimistic person in general. However, I also very much see myself as a realist, um, which sometimes uh, comes off sounding a little bit negative. Sometimes I don't have the, uh, the you can do anything uh approach like to cognition where it's like i believe that i can do anything and therefore i believe it and i succeed and people who have that are incredibly successful um sometimes i tend to be a little bit i don't i don't think that i'm very negative i tend to land in the middle um and so like i tend to be a little bit overly realistic about how i think about things um and so cognition wise like my internal dialogues um are sometimes not constructive or helpful uh, it's like, well, realistically this, and it's like, that doesn't really help. You know, we already knew that <laughs> say something positive. So we can like maybe punch through and achieve higher, you know? Um, so that's, that's my, that's a little bit about my cognition, uh, interpersonal, like social influences. I've got a fan freaking tastic social group. Um, so, uh, I've got, a, uh, a, my parents, super supportive parents, super supportive friends, you know, I've spent, I've put conscious effort into developing healthy relationships. Uh, and then the drugs and biology, health status wise, I'm in a pretty good spot health wise. You know, there's not a lot of like uh, biologic things that are holding me back um, when it comes to like initiating positive changes, right? So if I were your client, based on everything I just told you, right, you start thinking about like a lot of personal information that I just gave up, right? You can see like emotionally, uh, sensitive, but like imagery and cognition, these two. And then, you know, knowing a lot about like what my behaviors are, like I said, I like to be a creature of habit. Sounds like these are probably the three things that you as my personal trainer, if you wanted to get me on an effective diet and exercise program, you would probably focus on creating something that would benefit from the fact that I like routines. And then you would probably, you know, try to make sure that I am consistently conjuring up image, like successful image imagery in the future be like hey i want you to imagine like what you're gonna look like when you're walking down the aisle you know like uh if you get a client who's like getting ready for a wedding that's my favorite example of imagery like i want you to imagine what you're looking like when you walk down the aisle in six months right uh or i want you to imagine like what you're gonna look like here or how you're gonna perform here like what do you you know i want you to imagine this right keep that in your mind bring it up every session right cognition it's like what are three positive things that you said about yourself today you know like little things like that those would be really effective for certain people other people totally different you totally different unless you're you know listening to all this and you're like i'm kind of like that <laughs> then maybe not totally different but yeah andres talking about freaking meditation right i think you hit the nail on the head for somebody like me 
Um, I don't know if it would help with the behavior side of things, but you look at like the imagery and the cognition part, right? Uh, uh, meditation has been shown to help people learn how to conjure up better images, um, which is what we'll talk about when we get to the imagery day, actually. Um, and then like it has been absolutely, it's probably the number one tool to help someone uh, create healthier internal dialogue. Um, you know, uh, just how people talk about themselves, how you, the, the voice you hear in your head, you know, your shoulder angels. <laughs> uh, uh, those are, <laughs> sorry, I'm thinking of the shoulder angels from the Emperor's New Groove, <laughs> which are my two favorite shoulder angels in movie history. I was like, no, no, he's got a point. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, that, that it, uh, uh, meditation is just an incredible way to improve your cognition, improve how you talk to yourself, how you think about yourself, things like that. Um, do you guys have any questions or comments? Comments can, you know, love the comment part. This is such a great class for discussion. Um, but does everybody understand what the basic it is for? Yes, sir. All right. So yeah, that's what we're looking for here, right? Um, having an understanding of these aspects of a person's personality, it can help you determine which things are going to be most effective. Um, and like I said, Andre, I think you, you had a good instinct. We, I don't think we even got to cognition by the time you brought up the meditation thing, but like, you know, for somebody like me who tends to, I think that like sometimes like my internal dialogues are the number one thing that kind of hold me back from over achieving or overperforming in certain ways. Um, and meditation is a great way to combat that. Um, for other people, it's a little bit different, you know, for other people, like, let's say somebody has, um, you know, let's look at like sensation and drugs biology here. Let's say you have a client who has uh, really severe chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, right? So sensations, this person physically feels just aches and pains on in a way that like someone with a, a normal, you know, lifestyle isn't going to experience, right? Um, so even the interventions like outside of the realm of like thinking, uh, outside of the realm of like the psychology, we're going to focus a lot on creating programs that have been shown to like, you know, reduce inflammation and pain, right? So their health status is slightly compromised. They tell you like, I have fibromyalgia. And then when we talk about like their sensations are like, yeah, I, I physically feel like aches and pains every day. Um, you know, it's crazy. Isometric exercise has been shown to be one of the best ways to reduce pain. We don't a hundred percent fully understand why. Um, typically like eccentric and concentric and isometric, you know, they all kind of, they're all kind of working towards the same goal. Eccentric tends to be really good for inflammation. So that's actually a really great way to, uh, you know, bulk up. Um, eccentric lifting has been shown to, to kind of be really effective for like bulking. Um, concentric movement is obviously just you know, that's the, li the, the shortening lifting part. Um, but isometrics, there's this weird connection between like isometric exercise and pain. So anytime I've got a client who has um, fibromyalgia, which is sort of undefined joint pain, uh, a lot of times I will focus on doing certain types of isometric exercises. Now, that being said, if my client's drugs biology said they have arthritis, which is another version of that's going to lead to different types of pains, I will super avoid isometrics. Um, even though isometrics are associated with pain, isometrics have been shown to make arthritis worse. So these are where like understanding our special populations, which uh, Charlie, I think you're the only one who's been through special populations in this course. Um, you know, this is part of like what we need to understand. You know, we do need to, we do need to know about our special populations, uh, if we're going to talk about like certain bits of this, but you know, again, different interventions for all of our different clients. I always love to say it different strokes for different folks, you know? <laughs> so, um, Having an understanding of these aspects, uh, it allows us to, to institute the, the most effective change. Um, so a lot of times, so how are we gonna do this? How are we gonna figure out our client's basic id? How are we gonna figure out their behavior, their effect, their sensation? How are we gonna learn about them? Well, oftentimes uh, this is gonna come in the form of like a screening questionnaire, you know? Um, we'll do written responses, 
so that our client can basically give us uh, like a very detailed version of like what their thoughts and actions and feelings are, right? Um, and we like the written responses rather than just conversation uh, because generally tend, people tend to be a little more thoughtful uh, when they're writing stuff down. Now, I will very rarely do this in the beginning of working with a client. Um, oftentimes I will do a little bit of like screening just through verbal questions in like my first session. Um, but part of like a homework that I will often send my clients home with is this right here. So this link, uh, which is in your notes, this is not part of, um, this is not for download like in the NASM course or anything, but this is actually a weight management questionnaire I found online <laughs> years ago. Um, I, I don't know where it's from. I enter Mountain Healthcare. I literally was just looking for I, I was like a weight management screening questionnaire. It's one that I found years ago and I've all, I've, I really like it. I think it's, it kind of covers all the bases that I find are very important. And so um, I will often ask my clients a little bit about like what their height, what their current weight is, how often do they weigh themselves, right? So you can see here, right? Height, current weight, right? That is directly related to my clients like drugs biology, right? Like that tells me a little bit about their health status. Um, what's the high, their highest weight as an adult? Like, what was it and when? Um, what was their lowest weight and when? And then like, what do they do to get to their lowest weight? Like if they did something, I want to know, right? Um, if they're like, yeah, well, I, you know, was on the swim team uh, in college and that was when my weight was at its lowest. And it's like, okay, so it sounds like, I mean, like you just, sounds like you probably built like a lifestyle around like fueling this activity. And then when that activity was removed, you don't know how to like adjust your lifestyle accordingly. Um, what was their childhood weight? Like, what about their significant others? Like their spouse, are they overweight? Uh, your children, are they considered overweight? Right. This can also be really helpful because again, we're going to learn a little bit about our drugs and biology. Right. Um, oh, and then well, there was one other one that was also up here about their behavior uh in this first section my brain my brain is broken what did i think oh how often do they weigh themselves that's right uh i want to know about that if they're weighing themselves every day uh clearly there's like premeditation like that tells me a little bit about their behaviors and also tells me a little bit about like the imagery they're conjuring up we don't we know we tend to do the things that we do the most tend to be things that uh sometimes makes us most anxious so it sounds like you know um, they have some negative imagery probably conjured up around this idea of weight. Uh, what about like to any previous like uh, attempts to lose weight, any medications that they've taken, any supplements that they take, right? Um, what's the main thing that motivates them? So now I'm trying to get an idea uh, of like what their cognition and their internal dialogues are, right? Up here, by the way, a little bit about like interpersonal relationships too, by the way. Um, you know, and I love this one. Do you eat for the following reasons, right? Um, love to know like why my client is, is you know, what do they, how do they see food? They see it as fuel. They see it as this thing that's holding them back from meeting their results. Uh, this thing they don't want to do, but they have to do. Does it have like they have really negative emotions around it, right? Um, do you compensate for overeating by fasting or, you know, using laxatives, vomiting or exercising? So this is looking for, you know, does my client struggle with maybe like an disordered eating, uh, like bulimia, for instance, they ever hide their eating from others. Um, so a lot of questions here, pretty detailed questionnaire. I really like it. I have found that it is a very helpful questionnaire uh, when dealing with like certain weight loss clients. I don't use it with every one of my clients. I don't. Uh, I will often only implement it with my clients who, um, uh, you know, are really like struggling with their weight. If they are, you know, in the ob, if they if they fall into the obese category and they tell me that they've really struggled with their weight, and if they are like, hey, I really need to figure out like, what, you know, how to structure my habits and stuff, I'm gonna do this, right? I, I'm definitely gonna ask specific questions directly related to all of these things because I need to understand. Like, I gotta get in my client's brain. I need to know how they think. I need to know how they feel, how they behave and how they act. Right. Um, so these questionnaires are really great. One other side note here, guys, and this is actually, I think this is a homework question. Uh, hint, hint. Um, the use of questionnaires can enhance your, at, like as a professional, it can enhance your credibility. Um, people like receiving stuff, you know, people like it, it feels like 
it's like oh this this person really has their stuff together they they're handing them like a, a full questionnaire um so i i do like that um it can really enhance your credibility uh this is why we like handouts so much um you remember from our our nutrition class we talked about like printing out handouts and giving them to your clients people like that people just it's something that makes you seem more professional um in the same way I, I that I tend to have, I have like a, what did I say one time? Uh, I think the, when we were in nutrition, I think I said this, um, I have a million like verbal handouts <laughs> and verbal handouts are obviously something that don't exist. Uh, but you know, what that is, is like when my client says this, I go, that reminds me of the time that I had another client who did this, but, and I'll tell a little story behind it. And they go, huh. <laughs> um, to me, that's like a verbal handout. Um, Okay, so uh, any questions on basic ed? We're gonna move into talking about the stages of change here next. Um, any questions on uh, basic ed? All righty. All righty. So uh, let's take a look at the theor change theoretical model of change here. Again, the stages of change, right? So. If we can do a little bit of what's called like a multimodal screening, this is a little bit different than just uh, uh, you know a basic questionnaire here. But the idea here is this was designed by uh, these two brothers, uh, Arnold and Cliff Lazarus, um, and basically they're they're gonna like divide this questionnaire into two major sections here. Um, now, uh, one of them is like your personal and social history, and one of them is like an analysis of current problems. So I want to show you uh, the Arnold uh, and Clifford Lazarus uh, multimodal screening questionnaire. I want to show you guys this here real quick. Um, Come on, where's the actual questionnaire? Oh yeah, there it is. Uh, okay, <laughs> so this is kind of funny because it's available for purchase on freaking Amazon. Um, I guess they're not gonna show very much of that, uh, which is funny, you don't have to purchase it on Amazon. You can get it here. So here is the original questionnaire, guys. Um, that's hilarious. I just saw an immediate typo. I, saw, I, was like, I, saw, I was like, why did I see the word ass? <laughs> uh that should be as necessary <laughs> records as <ass> necessary <laughs> sorry i am a child uh <laughs> so here's the original questionnaire right look at how many questions are your name and you know all the classic stuff objective information uh and then like what kind of jobs have you held in the past um have you ever attempted to boom, 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 boom. personal and social history questions 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 uh moving even further forward description of like you know presenting problems moving far forward expectations uh regarding therapy and then do you overheat do you have take too many risks do you see yourself as lazy you have concentration difficulties this is 15 pages and then structural profile like your behaviors your feelings your sensations there's our basic id down here at the very bottom rate yourself uh, with like, you know, on like these seven points, um, how much of a doer are you on a scale of one to seven with seven being the highest? Um, how passionate are you with a one to seven, right? Um, how tuned into your physical sensations are you? What do you tend to like, what kind of imagery do you make? What are your thoughts? What are your feelings? Are you a planner, right? All of these freaking things. But look at how much we had to get through before this. <laughs> so the original multimodal screening is pretty much something you want to avoid <laughs> as like an, a, a fitness professional. It's just way too much information. Like I said, we're getting into assessment territory at that point. Um, but that being said, if we could distill that information and filter it down into something that's a little bit more um, effective for us as fitness professionals to use, we would basically ask questions directly related to, is our client ready to change and if we can just distill all the information that is the most valuable thing that we can learn and that's where we kind of move away from that giant questionnaire to something a little bit more simple like this and by the way you can make your own questionnaire you don't have to follow any version of this but this version here two pages mostly related to like food 
um, and like diet and exercise, diet and exercise, right? So like a definitely much more filtered down version of this. Now, once we figure out a little bit about like what our clients like behaviors are, um, we can look at the stages of change model to understand like, are they ready for change? Now this, like I said, this is in your regular textbook. And I know we've talked about this in previous classes, but these are free points if you have all of these, you know, memorized. Um, so looking at pre-contemplation, right? Oh, sorry. So the stage of change model is used to integrate the principles and processes of change across like all major theories, right? So we are going to revisit the stages of change tomorrow, the next day, the next day, when we're gonna be looking at all these different tools that we have in our tool belt. Like tomorrow, I believe we're looking at behavior therapy. Uh, right, am I crazy? Yeah, oh no, no, we got goal, that's right, we do goal setting first. So tomorrow we're gonna get into goal setting, right? Um, you gotta set the right type of goals depending on where your client is in the stages of change. Uh, behavior therapy, we need to know what types of behaviors we should be targeting based on where they are in the stages of change. Um, CBT, effect imagery, right? All of these things um, integrate with the stages of change model. We need to know which tools to use in them though. So, uh, you know, today we're just kind of introducing this, these, this model again so we understand it. So pre-contemplation, uh, clients who are in the pre-contemplation stage, these are individuals who have no intention of making a change in the foreseeable future. You know, if you were to come to me and say like, hey, Brad, we're going to make you, uh, you know, uh, NASCAR, the, the most successful NASCAR driver in the world. You got to start training to, to be a NASCAR driver. And I'm like, what? I've never even watched. No, nope, not interested. <laughs> like, right? Pre-contemplation. Um, now, I'm not saying that you couldn't absolutely convince me someday. You probably could, you know, with the right tools and the right behavior change strategies. I think you can convince anybody of anything. Um, but as of right now, I'm not thinking about it. <laughs> so that's pre-contemplation, right? Um, individuals who uh, have no intention, right? So these are individuals who do not exercise and they also don't intend to start exercising anytime within the next six months, right? Generally, the reason people are in pre-contemplation is because they are often unaware of the consequences of their current behaviors. So like a lot of times people, um, you know, might be like, yeah, I want to, you know, uh, look a certain way or I want to feel a certain way. And I'm just frustrated. I don't, I don't feel as good as I want to feel. I was like, oh, well, have you thought about like exercising regularly? And they're like, no. <laughs> okay, right? <laughs> to us, I mean, it seems really obvious, right? It seems, sounds incredibly obvious. But again, a lot of times people are just unaware of the consequences of their actions. Like, well, you know, like not being sedentary has been linked to heart disease, arthritis, you know, lots of different diseases and lots of different conditions that are very, very negative, right? Um, you know, that's somebody who's in pre-contemplation. Even like smokers, right? Like you would think that with all the information that's out there telling people about how bad vaping is, about how bad smoking is, I, if, I feel like everyone's aware of it. There's a label, there's a warning on the freaking pack. You know, everyone's aware of it. But I think that like, even in pre-contemplation, it's not always just being aware like verbally, like ask a smoker, it's like, you know, it's bad for you, right? And they go, yeah, I know it's bad for me. Like they'll say, it's like, yeah, I know, right? But like, they don't, really know a lot of times <laughs> like if there's somebody who's like not interested at all in 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 changing um and it's like i mean do you really know though i mean do you know what it's going to be like to have to breathe out of a freaking tube um and this is where uh you know you'll hear people uh, this is why they use so many scare campaigns in uh you know commercials and stuff like that for like anti-smoking ads where they're like this many people die every 60 seconds you know and then they a bunch of people die in like town square or whatever uh, looks like a freaking prank show uh the, the reason why is because they're, they're trying to like draw awareness to this this thing right so that's pre-contemplation now cons and again it's a six month time window there so they're not intending and changing within the next six months now, let's say somebody is like, all right, I'm a smoker. I want to quit smoking, right? And they, they say that they want to, right? They're still smoking, let's say a pack a day, but they're like, I want to quit. And in the next six months, I'm going to quit. I'm just waiting for January 1st to roll. I can't tell you how many times. 
Uh, they're like, I'm waiting for January 1st. I'm waiting for the new year. And then I'm going to quit smoking. It's like, you could quit now. Uh, <laughs> so individuals in this stage, the contemplation stage, they do intend to change uh, in, within like a six month period, but uh, they haven't taken any steps yet other than maybe verbal confirmation that they want to change, right? So they are often aware of the pros and cons. They're like, I get it. It's bad for me. Therefore, I shouldn't do it, right? They get it. They're aware. Um, so they're thinking about either becoming more active or changing their habits in some ways. Now, one thing to be aware of is that oftentimes, you know, that six month window will come and go. <laughs> they're like, all right, it's in six months, it's going to be January 1st, and I'm going to quit smoking. Suddenly it's January 2nd, they smoke another pack. And that's like, what happened? Right? So that is where, you know, were they actually in the pre contemplation stage? No, they could have genuinely been in contemplation. They may have legitimately been thinking about changing. Um, they just weren't, they just didn't have the tools to move out of contemplation into the next stage of preparation. So what ended up happening is they just do a double loop in contemplation again. They're still aware of the pros and cons and they still genuinely want to change like in here. They're just not doing the things up here to make it happen. So. This is what leads to chronic contemplation. Uh, everybody in this call, I guarantee you, in some aspect of your life, I know that I'm doing it. I feel like everyone in the world has some version of chronic contemplation that they are like in the middle of. <laughs> um, you know, uh, we're all chronically contemplating something where genuinely you're like, I'm gonna do this. And then six months comes and go and you're like, I didn't do it, but I do genuinely want to, <laughs> right? Um, that's chronic contemplation. It's just this sort of getting stuck in the idea of like, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. Six months comes and go and you're like, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. And then another six months comes and goes, right? Um, so chronic contemplation, uh, you know, is where people tend to have like a little bit of ambivalence um, towards like weighing the costs uh, versus the benefits. They're like, you know, the costs are too high. I'm just not ready right now to do this. You know, um, I was in chronic, like I said, I was in chronic contemplation about getting my freaking credit in line. Uh, Cause I was just like, it's too much work. It's just, I don't know. I don't have all the time for that. I'm a busy person. Like I just don't, there's no way I have all the time available to commit to this. And then, you know, watched a freaking video about doing it. And it's super easy. Literally just, you know, cost a little bit of money somebody does most of the work for you and then go get a credit card and use it responsibly. <laughs> so anyway, uh, sorry, that's a very personal one where I'm just like, I'm so mad at myself for the last years. Uh, so there's chronic contemplation, right? People tend to stay in this stage, right? Now preparation, let's say somebody finally, you know, moves outside of contemplation into the preparation stage. So preparation are people who do intend to attain, uh, take action. And this is within the immediate future, right? So people in this stage are people who actually might be exercising occasionally. Um, it may be rare, but they are like still engaging in an activity. Uh, but they're planning to begin like exercising like regularly within the next 30 days. So a lot of times you will get new clients who are in the preparation or action stage. Um, Preparation is like a big spot. These are this is where sometimes it's a little bit challenging to, to make a sale. People who are in the action stage are usually like they come to you and they're ready to like sign up for training. But if you get a client who's like a potential client in the preparation stage, like you're talking to them and you're like, okay, like, well, have you exercised? Like, have you been using this new gym membership that you got? And they're like, yeah, I got it. But like, you know, I've had it for about a month now. I was like, great. How many times have you come to the gym this month? And they're like five or six. I was like, okay, like that's a little more than, you know, that's a little more than one a week. But like, it's definitely not like regular, right? And it's like, did you go on the same day every single time? It's like, no, I just kind of went whenever it was available. It's like, clearly this is somebody who's like dipping their toe in the water. We need to find a way to push them into like regularly attending, right? Regularly engaging. And so we ask them a series of questions we under and we can understand a little bit about like where they are in this stage of change model. And we're like, all right. So people in this stage, you know, they want to become more active, like more active within the next 30 days. Generally, these are the people who don't know how to. So your job is basically going to be to get them to commit to something that puts a little bit of pressure on them to show up. 
this is honestly where like us just having training sessions is really just a very effective thing. Um, I will often, you know, uh, even just tell people and it's like, honestly, you know, what some of the, one of the biggest benefits to hiring me is, is just a little bit of like self pressure. I'm going to be encouraging you. and I'm going to bug you to come to the gym regularly, you know? And it's like, don't be wrong. I've got a lot of other things to offer you <laughs> a lot of other benefits to working with me. Obviously you're going to get some great workouts. Obviously you're going to you know, have access to like my advice and things like this. But part of the best thing that I do is like, I'm a glorified like appointment reminder, you know, <laughs> like I'm a push notification on your phone that bugs you to do what you said you're going to do. And I'll tell I'll be black and white to tell it to people if I feel like it's the right thing to say. And uh, it's so funny. You'll see, you watch people's like eyes get big and they'll laugh and they're like, that's so funny. It's like, that's such an honest answer to like what it is that like I need. I just need someone to push me. I was like, yeah, that's kind of what a lot of people need a lot of times. Um, it's so funny. I mean, you can spend all day being like, I'm highly educated. I'm the world's greatest trainer. I'm going to motivate you. I know the best exercise. And you could say all that. But like sometimes you're just not speaking the right language to people. Sometimes people are just like, look, I'm a glorified push notification on your phone. <laughs> like 24 hours before you're supposed to be here, I'm going to bug you and make sure that you actually show up. And they're like, that's what I need. I'm like, great. Pay me. You know, like hire me because um, I want to see you succeed. Let's do this. Um, so preparation, a lot of times, uh, one of the best things you can do is just create an action plan with them. Um, get them a plan of action. Be like, all right, here's what we're going to do. I want you to do this. I want you to do this. I want you to do this. And it's like little bits of homework. Um, that will push someone from preparation into the action stage. So you maybe give them a hard task and hard action that they have to achieve. You can do an easy one too. Easy ones are great because they're a great thing to build confidence, but hard ones sometimes lead to higher levels of achievement. But also don't make them too hard because we don't want to derail somebody when they first started. Um, so that's, that's the type of interventions we would use for somebody in the preparation stage. Um, now we've got the action stage. So these are people who have actually made specific changes. They just haven't really been able to maintain it consistently um, for a full like six month period anymore. So like this is somebody who's like at risk for falling backwards, right? Um, generally, this is somebody who's like, yeah, I'm coming to the gym regularly, but I'm starting to like lose motivation. They feel like they're on the cusp of like, they're worried about falling back into old habits. So, you know, um, the, you know, these are people who actually might be exercising regularly, but um, when we look at this, not all behavior modifications count as actions. Um, we're looking at like things that are specifically related to their goal. So maybe you have a client who says like, yeah, well, I've been exercising regularly for six months. You're like, okay, that's great. Um, what was it? What was your goal? And they're like, oh, well, I'm trying to like, you know, gain a substantial amount of muscle. And it's like, oh, okay, cool. Um, so what have you been doing for the last, you said you're coming to the gym regular. It's like, well, you know, I, I do a little bit of cardio. Um, I'm going to the, the yoga classes. It's like, okay, so those are actions that are definitely helping create like habits and I'm super stoked. But like, have you put specific effort into like lifting weights? Like, have you, have you been doing like muscle building strategies? And they're like, well, I'm a little intimidated to go onto the gym floor. And that intimidation has kind of kept me away from all of that. So I'm using my gym membership in other ways, but I feel like I'm gaining muscle. It's like, I love that you feel like you're gaining muscle, right? Um, but it sounds like, uh, you know, we need to find a way to get over that intimidation factor because this is what's really going to help you, right? So that's, that's a lot of our clients in the action stage. A lot of times, like, we are going to push them into something that's more challenging, pushing them a little bit uh, into, like, moving into something honestly more difficult is a great way to make sure they don't fall backwards because the other thing just has to stay as a foundation and they subconsciously will just leave that alone while they work towards like a larger other goal so um people in the action stage are at risk for falling backwards into their old habits so we push them forward to make sure that they can't fall backwards now, the clients in the maintenance phase, these are people who have actually made specific changes. They've maintained them uh, for, for six months or greater, and it's become like a habit. This, very similarly to action, one of the best ways to, to really keep them and you know make sure they never risk you know relapsing uh, is also to get them to you know go to the next level. Or 
One of my favorite methods is to get them to become a leader in other ways and lead other people towards like taking a similar journey as them. Um, I love clients who are in maintenance who have like, you know, lost like a lot of weight and stuff. One of the best ways to like maintain that is to be like, hey, let's get one of your friends inspired. Do you have anybody else in your life that like you are, you think that like you could share your journey with? Uh, and they're like, yeah, absolutely. Right. And they get super motivated by that because like then they can be an inspiration to someone else. That is a great way to keep someone in maintenance. Um, and it's one of the reasons why like I like to share a lot of personal stories so much. I think that's why I'm a little biased towards uh, that that method. There's a lot of methods to keep people in maintenance. But my favorite one is to to have people inspire like others. Um, I love to talk to people about like what's going on personally in my life because it helps keep me accountable and helps me like better do things, you know? Um, so that's maintenance. And then there is termination here. Uh, termination is a client who basically has 100% uh, efficacy. Right? They're really not any risk of falling back into their old habits. You know, um, that's not really uh, something they're at much, much risk for. Um, so, it should be noted, uh, just to, to lay this out, I mean, obviously, we, we've already said this in, in previous classes and stuff, um, but just to reiterate here, because this is always actually quite important, um, there's no one theory that can account for how complex changing our behaviors actually is. You know, uh, these stages are open for interpretation. Not every technique is going to work on every client. In the same way that, like, your client, not every client is ready for change, you know, um, not every theory, you know, this, this screening process might not be the most effective way um, to gather information for everyone. So, you know, everybody's going to be different, different strokes, different folks, right? Um, the problem with most exercise programs we run into, like I said, is that it relies on the assumption that everyone's ready to change, right? Everybody's ready to like, I wrote the world's greatest program, so you should be able to do it, right? That's just not how people actually work, you know? Um, <laughs> and so uh, we want to make sure that like we understand these stages are open to interpretation. They're going to be a little bit different for every single one of your clients. So you're going to need to use different techniques with every single client that you have, which is why for the rest of this course, we are going to be talking about all of the different techniques that you can implement. Um, and you're going to need to pull on any and all of them, you know. Um, so we want to encourage specific processes that can help facilitate change. And we want to, and this is, I'd say, the most important part, match the right interventions to the needs of the right person in order to, like, achieve their success rate, right? We want to use the right principles for the right individuals. Um, so uh, match your intervention to the needs of your client, right? Uh, again, me. The kind of stuff that tends to work really well for me, I, I work really well with like task lists. I work really well when I have like, you know, boxes to check off. Um, that is an intervention that would be effective for someone like me. Someone else, totally different, right? Maybe they're going to be much more, uh, they're going to be much more influenced by like social pressures, right? Um, get them signed up with like a group. They're going to have a lot of group loyalty and they're like, oh, I got to go to the gym today and I really don't want to, but I know, you know, Terry's going to be there, so I got to show up. Right, that's going to be so effective for somebody else. So, um, we're going to use this assess whether or not they uh, are egg regularly exercising, uh, whether or not they are eating healthy. How do they deal with stress management? That's a huge one. Uh, or maybe like they they want to stop smoking. Right, all of these are regular like things that we can use the stages of change for. Right, it's like, well, do you exercise regularly now? Boom, you know, asking questions: Are they in preparation, contemplation? Where are they? Uh, what about eating healthy? What about just dealing with stress, right? Um, are you, you know, are you ready to start engaging in something that's going to help you reduce stress, like exercising, meditating, you know, uh, oh, quit smoking. Are they ready? Um, so like I said, one of the best ways to memorize this, by the way, guys, one of the best ways to, uh, to remember which stages is to understand the timelines. So free contemplation not changing with the next six months. Contemplation, yeah, they're going to change sometime within the next six month period. It could be a week from, you know, or well, I guess if it was a week, it'd be preparation, but it could be like a, a month and a half, right? It doesn't have to be a full six month period. Um, preparation, they're intending to change sometime within the next 30 days. Um, actions, they're just starting to change, but they have not maintained it. Um, so they're at risk for falling backwards. And then maintenance is like, they've changed, 
they're holding on to it for at least six months. We really just want to make sure that, you know, we get to a place where it's like, okay, you're really at no risk for falling backwards. Like everybody in this call is hopefully at no risk for falling backwards into showering daily, <laughs> you know, um, look at all the freaking ads when, when COVID first broke out, you know, uh, look at how many times we just kept hearing the phrase like, wash your hands, wash your hands, wash your hands. Right. And I remember like thinking, being like, are people just not washing their hands? Like, isn't that something that like is a regular habit for most people? Um, but I get it, you know, um, I've never been one of those people. Uh, this is so funny. This is, this is, you, I'm sure if I've got any germaphobes in, in the room right now, uh, you're going to be horrified at this. Um, I'm totally a regular hand washer when I'm done going to the bathroom. I've never been one of those people to bring the paper towel with me to, to, to the door. You'll hear it all the time where they're like, the doorknob is one of the nastiest parts of the bathroom. You should bring a, when you're done drying your hands, grab another paper towel and use it to open the door. Uh, otherwise, you're just putting all those germs back on from all the people who didn't wash their hands. I've never been one of those people until court, until this like quarantine thing. Uh, but I've been doing it for <laughs> we've been in this world for a freaking year at this point. Uh, and yeah, like I think I think at this point it's probably a new habit. You know, I would I would call I'm comfortable calling it a habit. Now I I do that. You know, dry my hands, bring the towel with me, grab the door, toss it on my way out. Um, it's a new habit and that's how that habit was formed you know and i didn't do it every single time consistently uh at least not at first so uh okay so remember the uh we saw how big that freaking multimodal screening questionnaire was where i mean it was massive so there's other versions right there's the version that i like this is by the way this is just me personally this is not a, a nasa thing this is just a, a brad recommendation um but the actual multimodal screening is pretty freaking huge. <laughs> so this is where another version of assessments that we have here um, is something that NASM came up with that takes the most important parts of the basic id and distills it down even further. Uh, and then they, you know, uh, redid it in their own little model here. So NASM came up with what they call the state of wellness influence model or SWIM. Uh, and this is basically going to combine the idea of multimodal screening with the stages of change model. So NASM tried to put the two together in such a way that makes it easier to focus on things that are directly related to like, you know, fitness. So interpersonal relationships is a big part of that. The imagery that people are conjuring up is a big part of that. How they think about things is a big part of that. Um, behaviors, obviously. And then they add it. So you can see that we lost um sensations like physically right sensations uh we kind of got rid of that one um drugs biology like the health stats we got rid of some of that um instead focused on the things that like we tend to like have a little bit of impact on and then they added goal setting um and so we can use the swim model to understand which stage of change we think our client is in um and understand like uh, maybe like what their intervention strategies, you know, which, which intervention strategies are going to be most effective. So the the swim model looks like this: you can see interpersonal, imagery, cognition, behavior, and goal setting. Are they thinking about using these things? You you know using these things, but not very regularly. Okay, using them a little bit, right? Um, where are they in the stages of change model? We're trying to basically get them into maintenance in all versions here. So an individual may have already developed like good interpersonal relationships um, that will help them like move forward. And so like that would maybe put them uh, in the action of the preparation stage. Be like, all right, well, it's like interpersonal relationships wise. Like if you told your friends that you are starting this fitness journey, um, have you asked your friends for encouragement in this fitness journey, right? And they're like, yeah, I have. So it's like, okay, so clearly they're, you know, they've taken some actions towards like using interpersonal relationships to their benefit. Um, or it's like, have you thought about like, you know, uh, have you like thought about like where you're going to be in six months? Like, are you, you know, if you have like a, do you have an internal vision board for meeting your goal, you know? Um, and it's like, no, not really. Like I haven't, you know, I just know that I want to get down to 160 pounds, right? It's like, all right, but you haven't, have you thought about like what you're going to look like at 100? Not, not really, right? Like I haven't really conjured up an image. 
Okay, so that'd be somebody, some of it's like, well, does that sound like something you think would be effective? And they're like, no, nah, never really done. It's like, all right, then free contemplation. <laughs> like, um, it's like, I want you to start thinking about like that. And so then we're going to move them forward until eventually they're using imagery, you know, effectively. Um, so that same individual who may have already developed some good, healthy interpersonal relationships could have negative thoughts about exercise, right? So cognition wise, they're in a place um, and, and imagery, right? So they're still very much in the contemplative stage, right? They're like, no, I still don't, you know, I'm here exercising regularly because my doctor told me to, right? That That's what's important. They're like, I, I did it because my doctor told me to, but they're like, okay, but like, are you passionate? Are you excited? And they're like, not really. I'm just doing it because I was told to. Like, all right. So cognition and imagery wise, they have a negative outlook about exercise they have a negative thoughts about exercise we want to get them to a place where like they are excited about it i was just talking to a friend this last weekend uh who was looking for some fitness tips and i was like so i want to get you on a very kind of regular it's it's a slightly boring routine but i just want to get you on the same routine three days a week total body exercise it doesn't give you too much stress it doesn't put too much emphasis on one place or another because we want it like what's important right now is just to start building the habit of you coming to the gym regularly so I built her a total body routine, same routine, three days a week, nine sets per body part. Couldn't be simpler. Um, and I was like, I hope that this is boring by the end of the month. And she was like, what? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I want you to be like, all right, I want you to, I want you to be intellectually motivated by the fact that like, I want you to, you should have this done 12 times within the next 30 days. And, uh, you know, I want you to go home and in your journal, she's got like a, she's got like a, a food journal and exercise journal. I want you to put a 12 box check thing. And I want you to lay three out here, four columns, three, I'm sorry, three columns, uh, four rows, 12 boxes. And I want you to check them off every time you complete one of these workouts. And like, it's going to be super exciting. We're going to have like a, you know, she's, she's really close to another one with one of my roommates. And I was like, we're going to come over here and we're going to celebrate when you get through all 12 boxes filled out. So that's like the motivating factor. She doesn't really enjoy working out. So like instead, we had to find some other motivating factors. Not going to be motivated by the fact that like, you know, um, she's exercising for a certain level. She's going to be motivated by the fact that like her friends are excited for her. Right. Um, so that is what we are aiming for. So that's the motivating factor here um that that i've got i'm using uh interpersonal relationships to push her forward and get her to build excitement about exercise right and we're trying to get her to regularly create behaviors meanwhile this week her job her homework that i gave her was i want her to come home and uh, go create like three fitness related goals that you know she can get excited about and then we're going to refine those so uh, that is how to use NASM's swim model. That is the basic id. Um, I'm sure you guys can already kind of see where today's homework is going to go. It's going to be a lot of questions related to behavior change in general. So today's homework is going to cover chapters one, two, and three. Um, hopefully you guys read chapters one and two over the weekend. Uh, read chapter three today. Uh, review the videos. Check your notes. A um, lot of questions related to, you know, you're going to see a lot of questions that are like, what's the definition of preparation? Um, a client who isn't changing, intent on changing within the next 30 days is a client who's in the blank stage of change. You know, that's going to be a lot of your questions today, guys. Um, so get familiar with the stages of change. Get familiar with the basic id. It's going to be a lot of definition questions. So um, definitely use your notes because I'd say in this class especially, most of the answers are going to be in in today and, and Friday's notes. Um, but hopefully that was fun. Uh, tomorrow we actually start getting into, you know, the toolboxes. We're gonna start doing all the stuff. <laughs> today was all about gathering data um, in the same way that we always start, you know, we talk about like how to gather data about our clients' bodies so that we can then write workouts. Um, tomorrow we're gonna start talking about like using these interventions. So uh, the first one we're gonna look at is goal setting. That's one of our biggest tools as trainers. You know, we use goals uh, to our advantage all the time. Um, but you guys have any questions? Kenny, Andres, Dalen, Charlie? Questions, comments, concerns? You guys feeling good? No, sir. So tomorrow you say we're gonna go through how we actually do these things or? 
it'll be the first of many. So, so this class is laid out a little bit uniquely. Um, you know, our program design classes, it, it's, it's structured kind of like our program design classes because it's written by NASM. So, you know, NASM writes all the materials kind of the same way. Um, you know, we go through stabilization, strength, and power, right? This, when it comes to behavior change, it's like you have goal setting as a tool you can use. Uh, you can help people conjure up healthy imagery. Uh, you could use social and interpersonal relationships. There's behavior therapy. There's cognitive behavioral therapy. There's like all these different things that we can use. I love behavior therapy. That's probably the number, the, the biggest thing that I tend to use is behavior therapy. I'd say with most of my clients, um, which is like habit loops. I, I really like to help my clients with habit loops. Um, again, I told you guys, I'm a big behavior guy. Like that's, that's, I like routine. Um, but it doesn't work with everybody. So instead it's like, oh, you are somebody who's going to benefit much more from like goal setting. So tomorrow is the first of many tools that we're going to be going over for the rest of this course. Um, it'll all relate back to today, but you could use goal setting, but maybe we have a client who's like, I don't care about goals. There's not goal motivated. All right, cool. Behavior therapy it is. Oh, nope, they don't like that either. Cognitive behavior, yeah. You know. So that's, tomorrow's the first of many days of different toolboxes. Um, oh, yeah, love goal setting. Goal setting is actually a lot of fun one. Any other questions? Kenny, I, I saw you unmute for a second. You got a question? Uh, not so actually not good. All righty, cool. They, uh, uh, yeah, I think on Friday I missed my class. Uh, that doesn't affect me, right? Or is it literally? Uh, just an absence, you know. Um, it'll not much, but you should absolutely go watch Friday's video um, and get caught up because uh, the homework for today is related to what our lesson was on Friday. So it, in terms of your grades, it will not directly affect you very much. Um, in terms of your success on today's homework, it could affect you greatly, <laughs> depending on how, you know, much you, you kind of make up for that by studying. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. <laughs> I was like, well, I, I don't know if I'm being clear. Um, but yeah, uh, and then if you ever have any questions, Kenny, because I, I think that, is that, that's like one of your first absences ever. Um, ask me a question or two, you know, give me a call. I will totally coach you through things. We always do like the private, you know, if you guys need tutoring, um, feel free guys. We, you know, I book um, appointments in with you guys. We can always set up a schedule to like chat at 3 p.m., you know, um, just try to do it Monday through Friday to help me out. <laughs> yeah, it was so rare because um, in the morning I woke up late and then I was like, all right, I'm going to do the afternoon class. But then my car broke down in the street and it was oh, unexpected. Man. I'm so sorry. That sucks. I've been there though. You know, I get it. This is why, um, yeah, this is why, like I always tell people, it's like, don't decide to go to one or the other. Try to make like, pick a habit, you know? Um, I, I mean, I love that it's flexible, but remember Kenny, the recording's up on Canvas. Go watch it. Go watch the recording. It'll help. I will check it out today. And then I have free, some free time. Love that, man. Love it. All right, guys. I'm going to let you everybody out of here. I will see you guys tomorrow for goal setting. Um, and start right. thinking, by the way. Oh, actually, sorry. I forgot the, the big thing that I always tell people at the end of today's class. Tomorrow is goal setting. So maybe start thinking about some goals that you want to bring into tomorrow's class. And we can work through them as a group. It's, it's, a, it's one of my favorite things to – I love – getting real goals from students and stuff. Um, I always bring my own, uh, and, you know, to tell you guys about stuff that I'm working on. Um, cause I love to share with you what's going on in my life. Um, but if you've got a real goal that you want to work towards and you're worried about like how to implement that into change and stuff, bring it tomorrow guys. Like that's what this class is for. Improve yourself. It's not just about like learning how to do it for your clients, like learn how to do it for you. Um, anyway, think about it and I'll see you guys tomorrow. I'll see you tomorrow, Brad. Thank you. I'd see you guys. Thanks. Of course.